languages royal global university on the topic aesthetics of self reading through phenomenology so what happens when uh, what happens when the traditional philosophical discipline of aesthetics is approached phenomenologically is it changed what are the consequences of phenomenology so on and so forth today we see the rapid rise of the discipline or idea called phenomenological aesthetics there is the important part that intuition plays in both aesthetics and phenomenological research the visibility of the phenomena that phenomenology deals with not only raises the question of invisibility but already contains most of the aesthetic themes and phenomenology clearly investigates phenomena of the life world and the artistic relation to that world so these are certain things that we as students and scholars of literature uh, and uh, humanities and social sciences do understand at this point today's topic specifically deals with the idea of self in phenomenological aesthetics from what i fold at this point from my lean understanding of it is that um, the uh, self is an in, uh, interesting site of aesthetic effect or even uh, an interesting dialogical location so to say so, uh, and phenomenological aesthetics is a, a distinct discipline that answers the question so looking at the scope of creativity and imagination today's talk as i gather from a resource person today's talk would focus upon introspective first personal experiences as a source of feeling affect and intentional correlation between a sense of self and its subliminal touch with an artistic literary or musical production today we shall hear learn think and deliberate on these and much more we have our guest speaker and learned panelists and we look forward to a very interesting and rewarding session ahead moving ahead with the agenda we have our senior professor professor uh, krishna borwas address now with almost four decades of academic experience professor borwa is a former professor in english department of humanities and social sciences iit guwahati she has published over 60 articles and has two books to her credit we are indeed very delighted and blessed to have her in our department as a constant guide and anchor and mentor ma'am can we can we have you and uh, may i request you to address the gathering can you see me uh no ma'am i we can hear you your video has to be turned on how do you turn it on ma'am there must be a, a video icon towards the bottom of your screen a video camera icon video recorder towards the bottom of your screen uh, it hasn't come out it doesn't come in mm -hmm. uh Ma'am, there must be because in the beginning your video was on when you joined. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, there is a green icon towards the yes, ma'am. Now it's on. Good morning. And first, let me welcome Prasenjit, mm -hmm. who has it's been. Uh, Namaskar. It, yes, it has been such a long time, and it's so, so good to see you after a decade. You are a very dear colleague. at iit guwahati i remember the uh, the discussions we had on philosophy and literature the, those were very you know interactive session and uh, it is really wonderful to have you with us yeah and it is like old times yeah, yeah. so um, you have changed of course in appearance as so have i <laughs> well so the talk is very very interesting today which uh prasenjit uh, please uh, i refer to you as prasenjit right because you were so much younger to me and you were so dear to me right and uh, uh 
this uh, interaction with uh, literature and uh, philosophy, because we are addressing mostly our literature students, has been constant. And we know that literature is more or less uh, dealing with experience, nuances of experience, and uh, more of consciousness studies, as you can see. And phenomenological uh, uh, pers uh, perspective deals with consciousness, per se, yes. So the subtle, you know, interplay of uh, uh, of of uh, uh, of uh, subjective as well as the objective experiences of what we we find in literature has been treated so well in philosophy, and uh, phenomenological uh, criticism has become a very very popular uh, part of literary criticism in in the recent times more so than deconstruction and the Marxist and the other sociological approach to literature. And I find that it is one of the very, very pertinent ways of looking at interpretation of text. And our student friends who are here will, uh, will uh, I think, benefit a lot from this uh, perspective from the philosophical uh, side of interpretation of text. And aesthetics, as we know, is dealing with perception, more or less. It also talks about judgment. It also talks about sensory details. And as uh, Tagore had said that uh, aesthetics is what? Ultimately, it rests with the eyes of the beholder. The beauty cannot be there without the beholder. So the beholder is the one with a subjective approach. This, this, the first person singular as I see, right? So the subjective approach, how you look at things, how you judge things, the century uh, uh, experience that you have, which has been taken in by, by philosophy as a part of a very important part of knowledge, not rational knowledge, but artistic knowledge or aesthetic knowledge, which you say, uh, is uh, something which adds to the uh, to uh, different domain of understanding text or different uh, domain of experience. When we talk of subjective and um, understanding of the first person singular or the way that we look at life narratives, the way that we look at things which are, uh, you know, uh, represented in, in uh, text or in fiction or in drama, wherever, we, we know that it is more or less the self, it is the, 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 the repre, uh, representation or it is the delineation of the self, the nuances of the self. And one of the things which is very close to when I saw your title presented was that the aesthetics of self and uh, phenomenological approach, I found that it was so close to what uh, Borges, Louis Borges, autobiographical essay, Borges and I, all right, so it is so close to that. The 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 way that uh, you know the self can have myriad connotations, the connections between the persona and the self and the other who has a hostile relationship. I think you will go into this. Okay, it's not always in uh, uh, complementary relationship, but sometimes you have something which is absolutely you know just in contradiction: the persona and the uh, the private and the public self. And of course, as Heidegger and um, Malu Ponti is one of my favorites, right? So they had said more about that you leave out all conditioning, you leave out the past. Conditioning should not be there, even thought should not be there. So phenomenology deals with such beautiful concepts of representation, you know, where you have your immediate perception of a thing or the object or experience. I think you will go into that beautifully. I will not say more of it. I was just saying that I know that our students are studying aesthetics. They are studying um, literary criticism. They are studying literature too. And this will be the first time that a philosopher has come over here to give us an idea about what is literary criticism. Thank you. We look forward to you and welcome you again, Prasant. It's beautiful to have you. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am, for those very enlightening and very pertinent introductory words.
Uh, we uh, uh, we have been joined by our honorable vice chancellor, sir. He had in fact joined in the very beginning. It was some error on our part that we could not see his name in the list. Uh, sir is very punctual and even amidst his uh, very busy schedule, it's time for all uh, to be a part of all the webinars. Uh, in the very outset, sir, thank you so much for joining. Uh, Professor Dr. S.P. Singh is a geologist, a management professional with many research papers to his credit. He's an eminent personality in academic arena. He has more than 26 years of experience in teaching, research, and academic administration. Way back in 2009, Professor Singh joined the Royal Global uh, uh, Institutions, uh, Guwahati, as the founder director and worked with the group for a period of five years. He then joined Amity Educational Group as the senior vice president responsible for academic administration of six Amity universities situated in different states of this country. In addition to that, he also served as the founder vice chancellor of Amity University, Chhattisgarh, for almost two years before joining the Assam Royal Global University in November 2016. To anchor this university to the heights of success and brand as we see it today. With more than three decades of rich experience in teaching, research, academic administration in institutions of repute across the nation, Royal Group is blessed twice to have the support of Professor Singh in its journey so far. Serving the second tenure as Vice Chancellor of Royal Global University, uh, Sir has been heading institutions of repute since the last 20 years and is a well-known academician and administrator having a very dynamic and enterprising personality. He is also the member of the Executive Council of Dibrugur University and Assam Task Force. Sir, thank you once again for joining even amidst your travel and your busy schedule. So kindly address the gathering. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pranami. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Because I have connectivity may have connectivity issues because I'm traveling on expressway from Lucknow to Delhi. Uh, uh, Professor Biswas, thank you so much uh, today on a very, very, very pertinent topic. Dr. Krishna Barua has already uh, given some insight about the topic and, uh, and Pranami, am I still audible? Yes, sir. So because I could see Dr. Priswa's, uh, you know, face. So I thought I have not been able to communicate. But anyways, uh, I will not take much time uh, in between the uh, steam gathering here and a very eminent Dr. Biswas. Uh, I don't know about about philosophy much, but philosophy is part of reading about his uh, pre-profile and anthropology and phenomenology in which he is an expert. So I was mesmerized, but then my uh, self, you know, knowledge limits up to science and a little bit into anthropology. That is my interest area. So I'm very, very eager to hear from Dr. Biswas and would definitely like to meet you physically whenever he's traveling to Guwahati and on the way to a airport or somewhere. So Dr. Biswas, you are most welcome to the university. And we are very, very blessed and pleased to have you amongst us, though on the digital platform today. Uh, with my faculty member. students or over to your program thank you so much sir over to your you. presence uh, i hope uh, yeah yes sir you were you were you were audible sir you were audible thank you so much for your words your presence really means a lot to us thank you sir moving moving ahead with the agenda now we have uh, the most, uh, the part to which we are looking forward with 
a lot of enthusiasm. We have amongst us our guest speaker, Dr. Prasenjit Biswas. Uh, Dr. Biswas teaches philosophy at Nehu, Shillong, Northeastern Hill University, Shillong. His uh, published books include Ethnic Life, Worlds in Northeast India, The Postmodern Controversy, Between Philosophy and Anthropology, A Four Years of Thought, Language and Consciousness. He specializes in phenomenology, philosophy of science, ethnophilosophy, post-structuralism, and social theory. Besides, he also writes op-eds and columns in national media on contemporary concerns. So the webinar is open to you now for your deliberation. Uh, good morning to everyone, especially my hearty regards and thanks to my uh, senior colleague, Professor Krishna Barua, with whom I had a very nice time in IIT Guwahati. Uh, I also thank profusely Professor Singh, the Vice Chancellor of uh, uh, Royal Global University, for being so kind and uh, for inviting me to meet him as well as his students and other teaching faculty members. In fact, uh, it's a great exposure for me, Professor Singh. Thank you very much for joining us even from such a distance um, over the uh, digital connection. I hope I'm audible to you. Um, yes. also, also my sincere thanks to Professor Pradeep Jyoti Mahanta, who happens to be my mama, my mother's colleague. And uh, my association with him goes back to 1978 when he came to Silchar and joined All India Radio. Uh, so he knows me since 1978, and it was a great pleasure to really have this proposal for talking to uh, the students of uh, Social Sciences, School of Social Sciences, in which he now acts as the Dean and also the students of English department. Anyway, uh, my, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful this morning to every one of you for inviting me for allowing me to speak to all of you uh, on a very uh, contemporary and relevant theme of my choice, as well as um, of uh, quite a lot academic significance these days. Uh, uh, the very idea of aesthetics, uh, which is uh, concerning a certain kind of appreciation of uh, art, appreciation of various genres of art, literature, and uh, various kinds of uh, performative uh, forms at this moment um, has assumed the global importance in the sense that uh, the, the traditional notion of beauty, the conventional idea of performance, and the uh, typical way of uh, understanding a performance or an art object in terms of how delightful, how pleasurable, or how beautiful it is, uh, is not good enough to understand uh, the critical context, uh, the context of creativity or the context of the imagination in terms of which uh, the artist or the creator create a piece of art for all of us to observe it or to uh, get a taste out of it. So uh, there seems to be a certain kind of a gap in our aesthetic understanding. We understand the final product as a product that gives us the value of beauty, but we don't take into account the context of imagination and creativity that goes behind creation of uh, an object or a subject of beauty or imagination. So therefore, uh, my talk would focus on this background uh, understanding of creativity and imagination that go into creation of an artistic object uh, about which we appreciate or we um, impute the value of beauty on that. So in a sense, uh, the artistic object you know, that is present before us, presents us with a new sense of self. The moment I watch a piece of art, let's say Pablo Picasso's Guernica, or I watch uh, Fida Hussein's uh, uh, imitation of Guernica. You know. uh, both Picasso and Fida Hussein's uh, Guernica actually produce uh, very different senses in our mind. When we watch Guernica, we try to immerse ourselves 
into the uh, kind of tension that Guernica presents in terms of the Vietnam War in which uh, uh, Picasso drew this uh, massive uh, signifier, I would say, of death and destruction in terms of a continuous uh, tension, in terms of an ongoing process of uh, 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 pain and anxiety and uh, some kind of a, uh, uh, some kind of an excruciating feeling of being destroyed. Uh, by the war, uh, but which gets a representation in terms of certain objects uh, creating a thematic in which the war needs to be uh, done away with. But when Magbur Frida Hussein imitates it, he gives it a more somber, a more uh, tensionless, but at the same time uh, exploring uh, a rather creative dimension in terms of how we move from a state of war to a state of peace, how our heart flies along with those flying horses that, uh, that uh, Fida Hussein wrote from Guernica. So now what I'm trying to say is that uh, this process of understanding art, this process of uh, creating a sense of value, this process of uh, uh, instituting a sense of taste, a sense of well-being, a sense of beauty in the mind of the Kunoishia, in the mind of the appreciator, you know, is a kind of a complex work of cognition, understanding, judgment, imagination, and the like. So the art object, in a sense, is able to mobilize the most complex cognitive functions that are induced by the art object as we watch the art object. So uh, I wanted to uh, bring this as the, uh, as the prefatory remark to my uh, basic idea of this talk, where I want to explore the nature of this uh, self that appreciates and that gets afflicted, that gets affected, that is impacted by the art object or by creation of uh, something artistic. Uh, so, here, one has to uh, distinguish between two notions of self. A self which is in touch with an art object is one kind of self. And a self which I have in terms of my self-consciousness and self-awareness. How that uh, basic self, where I have self-awareness, which gives me a perspective on the world in terms of which I own me as myself by taking a perspective up in the world, how that uh, self that is owned by me assumes this new dimension of appreciating an art object. Uh, there is a theoretical understanding here. There seems to be a certain kind of a space that is created between me as my pristine original self, a self which I own, and the art object, which is still not owned by me, uh, and which is still in the process of forming a certain cognition as I encounter that art object. So there seems to be a space between me and the art object. And it is in that space, a new self originates, the creative self, the imaginative self, the self that appreciates, the self that critically understands artist's imagination, that goes into creating that piece of art and that engages me in thinking about that piece of art, in cognizing that piece of art by mobilizing some of the most complex cognitive functions with which my mind is constituted. So there are these two notions of self, the self that engages itself with an artistic object and the self that is owned by me. So the point is that how that self which is owned by me, has this transition to a self that is encountering an art object. Is it a kind of subtle first person transformation of myself into the self that engages itself with an art object? And if it is a transition or a transformation uh, between myself and the self that 
uh, engages with an art object, if this is a transition from one self to the other, then what kind of transition is this? And this is exactly where phenomenology comes in because phenomenology is considered to be a science of experience and not just a science of experience, but how experience transforms itself into recognition, which is recognition. Experience transforming it, itself into a repeat cognition or a recognition of certain values, certain qualities, certain properties, certain characteristics that originates from a different source, such as an art object, you know. So this capacity of recognition of something that is there in an art object, uh, which creates not just an experience, but how that experience makes up now the sense of value that one receives from an external art object. Of course, I mean, my description remains a little complicated here. To simplify it further, I would like to say, my experience transforms itself into a value, a value which is lying not in my mind, but in the art object. Okay, so how does my experience does that kind of a, uh, that kind of a catapulting of itself, that kind of a translation of itself into a value, into a notion of equality, which is coming from an art object. How, how does that happen? As I said, it happens in that space between, in between space. This is not with me, nor this is with just with the art object, but it happens in between, in an encounter between me and the art object. That in between space is certainly not a physical space, but that, uh, that's a space which is an extension of uh, my imagination which is spurred by the art object, which is also an extension of the imagination that is there in the construction of the art object, extended to that space of encounter, which meets my imagination and uh, artist's imagination in the in-between space in order to create a sense of value, which comes from elsewhere, which was already not there with me. So you can see here, there is a certain kind of extended cognition. There's a certain kind of an extension of my self-awareness. There's an extension of my own ownership of me into uh, that meeting point between the art object and my imagination, okay? So, so that is extended, that is catapulted in a, in a different point in space. And that space is, once again, a space of experience, or rather the experience with which I began, and then this experience meets the experience of uh, uh, encountering an art object, and these two experiences come together in a meeting space, in the space between me and the art object. So that's a very different experiential space than the original experience with which I started watching the art object. So in a sense, the experience that I already have in terms of my self-awareness, in terms of my owning of my bodily self, you know, is now expanded, now extended. It is also a kind of implosion of my imagination, my own self-awareness into meeting another imagination or rather a product of another's imagination into a meeting space. Now, now this is what needs to be understood properly, how that meeting happens between me and the art object is something uh, that is uh, very, very important. And uh, here comes uh, a very typical way of understanding this experience. Uh, this experience 
is neither in me nor in the art object. So where is this experience? That's the question with which I started. So the answer to that question is that uh, that's a new kind of self for discussion's sake. Let's call it the aesthetic self. Why the aesthetic self? The aesthetic self is in the in-between space between the art object or aesthetic object and the original self with which I began my journey into the world, which already has a sense of self-awareness. Uh, that uh, self-awareness with which uh, I am endowed with is now encountering an art object which is endowed with the imagination and awareness of the artist in a meeting place. And that meeting place is uh, uh, a, a meeting place which is uh, constituting a new sense of self, which is this aesthetic self. Okay. So the aesthetic self is now rooted and now situated in that space of meeting between me and the art object. It's, it's not outside that space of meeting. Outside that space of meeting is my earlier orational self, which is potentially able to encounter the larger world. Of course, a part of that larger world that my orational self is potentially able to know and grapple with involves also probably the imagination of the artist, which has gone into production of an artistic object. So. You can see here two worlds are standing together in parallel. Uh, the world in which I'm meeting an aesthetic object and the world in which I'm open to the larger world, which uh, provides me the imagination, the creative energy of uh, the artist, of the creators in general, uh, that go into production of an aesthetic object. In no way I'm dissociated with that larger world. In a sense, I'm, I'm having a kind of permanent unity with that larger world. But that permanent unity with the larger world uh, is now manifesting uh, in a certain role uh, in the meeting space between me and the aesthetic object. That larger awareness is now, in a sense, uh, getting tunneled into, you know, it's getting tunneled into the encounter or the space of encounter between me and the art object. Uh, though it is getting tunneled into uh, that uh, space of encounter, yet I still have my access to the larger world and I'm still united in a sense, in terms of my consciousness about the world and my own consciousness of myself. These two consciousnesses are already united as if that larger consciousness of the world provides the, the substrata or the larger space within which this encounter between me and the art object is taking place. Uh, so this is something that aesthetics uh, as a traditional discipline is not able to say. Uh, this is uh, being said by phenomenologists. Uh, even uh, Immanuel Kant, who is, uh, uh, who for the first time defined the notion of an aesthetic self. Uh, defined it uh, in terms of certain faculties. The aesthetic self is defined in terms of faculties. Now, faculties are basically of uh, constant faculties are of two kinds, according to Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant, in his uh, famous text called Critique of Judgment, which is also called Third Critique, and without Critique of Judgment, we can't begin uh, this kind of a romantic understanding of my meeting the art object. You know. My meeting the art object uh, must assume uh, the idea of uh, a faculty of taste or a faculty of judgment. You know. uh, unless that kind of faculty is there, uh, the meeting between, let's say, a robot and an art object, which uh, lacks that kind of faculty, uh, which can only perceive or cognize, but cannot really impute uh, something finer, such as a value. Can a robot, can a robot in place of a human being, um, has, uh, can a robot have in place of a human being a sense of value, 
which it attributes to an art object. Uh, it's very difficult to have this kind of a uh, humanly programmed robot, which has this live sense of value. The aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic robot, if there is any such robot, the aesthetic robot can have an aesthetic program. The aesthetic program can tell uh, the robot about uh, the quality of an object, but the aesthetic robot cannot impute a sense of value. So what is there in that sense of value that is peculiarly human and which cannot be transferred to a robot or to the non-human beings? Is there something very specific to the human being that uh, creates an intrinsic sense of value, which is imputed, which is, uh, which is uh, ascribed, you know, ascribed not in the sense of ascribing it open something, but in the sense of absorbing that uh, art object and then giving it a value, which is a, a peculiar capacity or a peculiar faculty of uh, absorbing, absorbing the art object you know, uh, into one's own consciousness in the space of encounter which an aesthetic robot cannot do, but an aesthetic self, which is little away from the uh, original self, but which is again connected to the larger world in which the self has already established a connection, uh, can absorb, absorb is a word which, uh, uh, which is like reaching out, which is like touching the art object through one's senses, without uh, physically touching it. So it's a kind of touching through senses. It's a touching without the real touch, but at the same time, the aesthetic object is touched upon. It's a kind of a touching, touched relationship. And the direction of whether something is touched or something is touching, you know, that direction is somewhere blurred in the space of encounter, in the in-between space. So therefore the aesthetic robot is not able to experience that kind of a touching touch relationship between the aesthetic object and itself. But an aesthetic self is able to experience that kind of a touching touch relationship, which uh, gives rise to a sense of intrinsic value. A sense of intrinsic value, which is uh, not just uh, evaluation of an art object, but it is a certain kind of appreciation. It's a certain kind of acceptance. It's a certain kind of embedding of the art object in one's consciousness. So that that kind of embedding of the aesthetic object in one's consciousness is uh, a certain kind of sublimation. It's, it's a certain kind of condensation. Uh, it's a certain kind of a subtle psychoanalytic uh, processing. It's not a psychological processing, but a certain kind of a psychoanalytic processing. Psychoanalytic because it the, the act of processing involves the very mind, the very psyche in which this processing is happening. At no point of time, the psyche can separate itself from the act of processing and absorbing the aesthetic object by embedding it in one's consciousness in order to give rise to a certain value to that aesthetic object. So therefore, it's a deep psychoanalytical process, a depth process, which is different from the surface encounter that, all, that initially happened between a conusia, the aesthetic self, and an aesthetic object. So, so we come to this process of appropriating, inculcating, absorbing, receiving, and creating a value in one's consciousness by encountering the art object, which an aesthetic robot or a non-human probably cannot do because the space of encounter and the nature of that space is such 
that such an absorption is possible in the psychoanalytic depth of the human persona. You know, uh, Professor Barua referred to the notion of persona, the, the human persona that Jose Louis Borges, she referred to, you know, uh, uh, explains uh, in his autobiographical style. And also uh, Suzanne Sontag, for example, uh, in her uh, Theater of the Absurd, uh, talked about in terms of an embedding in consciousness, which uh, cannot be externalized. Because if what is embedded in a consciousness can be externalized, you know, then uh, uh, that externalized object of art uh, is, not, uh, uh, is not still a part of consciousness. It is rather uh, a kind of a disjunction or an alienation between uh, the, uh, the re-externalized object of consciousness, which is an aesthetic object, which is lying out there and the connoisseur is lying at a certain distance. The, the, the sense of proximity, uh, the sense of co-belonging to each other you know, is not there. And therefore it becomes a theater of absurd, you know, as uh, Antonin Arthur, or Susan Sonja, on, on her, her essay on Antonin, Antonio Arthur had talked about uh, in relation to theater of absurd. And then Jose, uh, Jose Louis Borges, talked about uh, the possibility of uh, this kind of an entwinement, uh, this kind of a labyrinthine entwinement with the uh, object of art or object of aesthetics uh, in which the value is embedded in consciousness. Uh, that cannot be externalized anymore once it is embedded in consciousness. And once it is embedded in consciousness, uh, the encountered object in a sense is dissolved is sublimated in the psychoidalytical depth. And, and then uh, there's a different kind of artistic embodiment by the aesthetic uh, persona or the aesthetic subject. The aesthetic subject becomes uh, the aesthetic object. The aesthetic object becomes the aesthetic subject. Uh, there is this kind of a sublimation uh, so, that uh, Jose so, Louis Borges talked about. Uh, so uh, uh, but, just, uh, yeah. sorry to uh, interrupt in between. Um, we also had a uh, presentation, I believe, uh, someone in the, we have a message in the chat box that the presentation is not visible. So I thought I would just take it up with you. The presentation is what? So we understand. had a, uh, did we have a PPT presentation also, sir, for the? Yes, but uh, anyway, I will show it sometime. But I'm not going by a PPT, you follow my lecture. Later on, I can give you a note also because... Uh, Normally, philosophers don't present a PPT. Huh? It's in a very rare context that we present. Okay. Although I have, I have passed on a PPT to you. You can share it with, uh, you know, students. That's not a problem. But okay, uh, okay. so so okay, let's uh, discuss this. You know, PPT will take a little more time. And so let's discuss this particular point because it is not uh, by the PowerPoint because PowerPoint don't have the power and the point as far as aesthetics is concerned. Uh, so anyway, I think I should go ahead or I stop here. What do you want? Do I stop uh, here? Sir, sir. No, sir. Please go ahead with your uh, deliberation. Okay. All right. Then it's fine. It may be a esoteric, but you must be able to understand that, you know, every discipline has its own esoteric way of presenting things. So anyway, so uh, point is that, how is that aesthetic value created by the human being, as I was saying? It's a process of absorption. It's a process of embedding in the consciousness. Uh, but how that embedding gives rise to the value is an important question. And to this question, uh, there's an answer that comes from uh, Immanuel Kant. And Immanuel Kant, uh, again, I'll read from Immanuel Kant. Uh, Immanuel Kant says that uh, this process of uh, creation of uh, uh, an aesthetic value is a kind of filling up the gap. There's a gap between the aesthetic subject and the aesthetic object. And the creation of a value, aesthetic value, is a kind of a filling up of this gap. And how this gap is filled up? You know? uh, in uh, Critique of Judgment, uh, section 298, Immanuel Kant had written, let me, let me read this. 
the inner moral purposive determination of men's being, the inner moral purposive determination of men's being supplemented that in which cognition of nature was deficient. So it's a kind of a uh, inner moral purposiveness, you know. It's a kind of inner moral purposiveness that supplements, that supplements the shortcomings of natural cognition. Now, an art object uh, is not just cognized in a natural way, because it's not just a natural case of perception, but it's also a case of immersion, a, a psychoanalytic you know, uh, dip into a certain process of the mind. Uh, and that process of mind is something like a sublimation, a very different uh, a thing than cognition, perception, or mere understanding that natural processing of cognition does. Uh, therefore, the aesthetic uh, valuation is the way to fill up uh, with a kind of uh, moral and purposive determination. You know. So there is a purposive determination in the static pen uh, that is created by embedding an art object in one's own consciousness. Uh, but that purposive value is open to a certain kind of introspection, an introspection which is part of the inner consciousness of the being of the human. It's, it's a kind of an inner consciousness, an inner consciousness that derives its resources from the space of encounter. Uh, it's not inner because it emanates from within, but it's inner because it derives a content, a deeply embedded conscious content from the art object, which is open to inner introspection, which is open to a first personal look at oneself. So when I'm looking at Guernica, I'm simultaneously looking at what is happening to my mind by uh, looking at the uh, famous painting Guernica. You know, uh, I, I watch myself in Guernica. I watch my responses to Guernica. And that's a kind of an inner look at me. It's a first personal look at me, which is not open to the world. Uh, but as I look at what is happening to me, that look itself is connected to the world. It's not open to the world, but it's connected to the world. Can the second person or third person know about the way I look at uh, my own feelings towards an art object? Well, uh, the second person or the third person can look at, provided, you know, uh, it has an expressive dimension. It has a certain expression from me. You know, it may have a gesture of pleasure. It may have uh, a sense of taste uh, arising from my own inner introspection to my own responses, uh, which is expressed uh, towards others uh, in language or in some other kind of a shared form. Uh, the the uh, can create a shared form between themselves uh, in looking at uh, their own responses and at the same time creating uh, a form which is shareable between them. Uh, they may all uh, jump together. They may sing together. They may, uh, they may utter together uh, a kind of a linguistic uh, expression that shares their inner joy or their inner pain, or whatever that be. So, so, so there is, again, another transition from my inner look at my responses to the uh, space of expression. And that transition is part of uh, the world of the... Uh, aesthetic object that is that is also part of the space of encounter. Uh, the space of encounter involves that expression that comes out uh, from my own introspection of my inner feelings towards an art object. Uh, now this expression uh, is simultaneously private and is also public. It's not entirely public. It's also private to a large extent. Therefore this first personal private understanding of an art object that becomes part of the public expression. 
or what is expressed for the other person or the second person or the third person, uh, which is part of that space of encounter. And the space of encounter cannot be separated from that kind of an expression, which is created uh, in me as a quinoetia, which is again another extension of my aesthetic self, uh, uh, is something uh, that assumes uh, the place of a greater value, which is nothing but a greater supplement. It supplements all the gaps that were there between me and the art object, between me and the other person. It is now supplemented by the expressions that are emanating from my introspective responses to the responses that have happened in me in the encounter with the aesthetic object. So therefore, these responsive expressions are simultaneously private and public. And this is something very, very important phenomenologically. Uh, so this uh, explains to us uh, what Kant calls as uh, the regulative aesthetic principle. Now, these expressions of mind that emanate from my first personal response uh, are regulative by their very character. Uh, these expressions do not constitute the art object, but these expressions regulate uh, further responses towards the art object. So therefore, these expressions are regulative expressions. Uh, and this inner moral purpose of determination, uh, which supplements my appreciation of an art object, in terms of these regulative expressions, you know, establishes once again a process and a relation that obtains between my aesthetic self and the other similar aesthetic selves. So, so there is a process here, uh, a process different from the cognitive process, a process different from just my realization of the value of art to a process that establishes a connection between one aesthetic subject and another aesthetic subject and yet another aesthetic subject in a certain kind of seriality. There is a sequencing and seriality of relationship that arises through this private come public expressions of appreciation that arises from the introspective first personal reflection and connects itself to another person and to another person in a seriality, in a sequence, which, uh, which would now create a distinct sense of self, you know, as if these selves are all acting together, these selves are reciprocally connecting themselves in a circuit of appreciation. And the circuit is becoming larger and larger and wider and wider. In fact, uh, the appreciation process is a historical process. It's, a, it's an intergenerational process. Uh, the, the appreciation, the level of valuation arrived at by a previous generation is now transmitted to the next generation and to the next generation in the process of this serialization of uh, uh, reciprocal expressions from one aesthetic self to another aesthetic self. It's a kind of a communicative aesthetics that happens between one aesthetic self and another aesthetic self. And this is the most critical aspect of aesthetic, uh, aesthetic imagination, as Kant would like to say. So Kant would say here, you know, once again, uh, the self as a process and a relation, you know, uh, implies a constitutive difference between me, the perspective of everything I call mine, such as my body, my past experiences, and singularities, and the other I, the perspective of the subjective position from which certain tracks of experience are felt as mine or not, evaluated and talked about. This means that this self implies both objectification 
and subjectification because, because it involves the synthesis of myself and the object of thought, which is me, with the expressive aesthetic force, which I create in order to communicate with the world, with other such aesthetic subjects. So, so it's a kind of a synthesis. It's a kind of a broad synthesis that Kant talks about here. Now, uh, this idea of Kant uh, is further uh, sort of elaborated by, uh, by Hegel, you know, GWF Hegel. And Hegel has written this famous text called Phenomenology of Spirit, you know, which is supposed to be a precursor of all kinds of modern phenomenology, which comes down to Husserl and Heidegger at a later stage. So in his uh, Phenomenology of Spirit, uh, this kind of aesthetic communication that happens between one aesthetic self and another you know, by way of a constitutive difference as well as by way of creating a set of expressions about what one has owned as one's own experience is a kind of a dynamical principle of synthesis. Both Kant and Hegel agree about this. It's a kind of a dynamical process of synthesis, which I, uh, which Kant at one stage narrated as a certain kind of sequencing or seriality, you know. And Kant would now say, you know, uh, that uh, the concepts of understanding that a particular knowing self already has about the world, these concepts of understanding uh, now are dynamically applied you know, to appearance of other aesthetic selves and the correlated experiences that these other aesthetic selves have. So, so the concept of understanding that one aesthetic self has and expressed in the expressive forms communicated to other aesthetic selves is a certain kind of a dynamical synthesis between one's concepts, aesthetic concepts, and uh, someone else's aesthetic concepts. Kant uh, talks about it in Critique of Judgment as well as Critique of Pure Reason, and Hegel in his Phenomenology of Spirit would agree with uh, this description of Kant and uh, would say that uh, this dynamics he adds his own point. This dynamics is something like a retrieval. You know, it's a process of retrieval. It's a process of restituting the original aesthetic experience in the midst of a number of aesthetic selves. The original aesthetic experience with which this whole process started seemingly got dispersed into uh, different expressions. Now, this, these different expressions uh, synthesize themselves, and this synthesis, which is dynamic, also leads to a certain kind of recovery, a certain kind of retrieval of the original aesthetic experience with which one started, with which one initiated this whole process. Uh, and this, Hegel says, uh, is something irreducible. Uh, this recovery of the original for Hegel in Hegel's uh, not much read lectures on aesthetics, which are supposed to be Hegel's last lectures, uh, and also in Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, uh, is a certain kind of recovery. It's a certain kind of restitution. It's a kind of retroaction. You know, uh, It's a kind of a, a retrospection, from introspection to expression to retrospection, Hegel would say. So this is the dynamical synthesis as the cycle gets completed. Now, what is recovered through this? Uh, this is something very, very important. What is recovered through this is uh, uh, this irreducibility of uh, the, the objectivity and the subjectivity, both. Uh, as Professor Barua will refer to in her introductory, uh, it's, it's a recovery of the original objective experience along with these multiple subjects, 
who are bound together by dynamical expressions, expressions of their own introspective, embedded valuation of the aesthetic object uh, expressed in language, partly private and partly public. You know? uh, and it's not uh, something that can be totalized, that could be that can be totalized into one description. Uh, it remains open to a certain kind of plurality, although it's a process of recovering the origin, the original objective, along with the original subjective. Yet uh, it's plural. It's never a kind of a unified, singular, one, unique aesthetic representation. So Guernica is not one. Guernica gets multiplied. And any such aesthetic object or an aesthetic text also will get uh, uh, multiplied uh, by this kind of a dynamical synthesis that Hegel has talked about, uh, which is uh, very, very interesting to really look at. Uh, so there is this, uh, then there is this uh, agency of this kind of recovery. And that agency of recovery is expressed in so many different ways. One of the ways in which this agency of recovery is expressed, as I said, is a certain kind of a filling up. Uh, but this filling up again uh, is, uh, is uh, in terms of uh, what, uh, you know, Deleuze has interpreted in Kant, uh, in terms of a certain concept of imagination and a certain concept of freedom. So to distinctive ways in which this recovery takes place. One of the way is a sense of freedom. And the other sense is that of imagination. Uh, now, uh, Deleuze, uh, whose name you must have heard about, uh, Deleuze is this uh, famous French philosopher, Giles Deleuze, you know, uh, who along with Guattari wrote this uh, famous work on schizophrenia uh, and uh, uh, developed something called schizoanalysis you know, as a kind of a methodology for understanding uh, this kind of a dynamical synthesis that Kant has talked about or Hegel has talked about in terms of recovery. So both dynamical synthesis and recovery assume for Deleuze. Deleuze wrote this famous book uh, published sometime in 1996 is called Kant's Critical Philosophy. Okay, the book is called Kant's Critical Philosophy. Uh, and there, uh, Deleuze is discussing critique of judgment and Kant's understanding of uh, aesthetics. And Deleuze is saying that this dynamical synthesis, you know, takes the root of freedom, while imagination takes the root of recovery. You can understand this two roots. Uh, that is again, two ways of movement of the human mind or human faculty. You know. uh, one way, one moves through imagination and imagination recovers, imagination retreats. You know. So imagination has this kind of a, one can say a certain kind of a retrospective movement in imagination. And only when this recovery of the original aesthetic object, along with the aesthetic subject, who is encountering, it happens in imagination, you know. Only then the dynamical synthesis can create a sense of freedom, okay? Now, uh, this is something, a mixture of uh, aesthetic and also something that is teleological, then uses point out. Aesthetic is that imagination which recovers. And teleological is that which frees this imagination completely by way of a dynamic synthesis, which results into a certain kind of communicative aesthetics, a communicative aesthetics that serializes, that creates a sequence, that pluralizes, and that never comes back to one original uh, aesthetic object, which is just recovered by imagination. So from imagination, which recovers, uh, it moves into a certain kind of plurality, a certain kind of multiplicity, because there are these multiple 
aesthetic subjects who are participating in the process. So therefore, there is a multiplication of the orational aesthetic content or the theme, the aesthetic thematic, probably, uh, in, uh, let's say, an aesthetic object such as Guernica uh, gets multiplied into you know, a number of interpretative possibilities, a number of experiential possibilities, and the more it opens up to this kind of possibilities. The greater is this renewed possibility of aesthetic communication, and greater is the chance of a finer, a more nuanced understanding, or a larger appreciation of the aesthetic object in the public discourse. Okay, And Deleuze points to this possibility that arises from Kant's two roots of imagination and freedom uh, in his uh, um, book on critical philosophy, Kant's critical philosophy. And therefore, uh, imagination's role here, you know, Deleuze would say, and I quote, reflect a particular object from the point of view of form. Imagination reflects from the point of view of form, the form of an object. You know. And the form is something like a schema, you know, Kant would say. Uh, a form doesn't have a content. A form doesn't have a flesh as yet. The form is boneless and fleshless, but form is a certain kind of a scheme. And the scheme is an imagination. It's prior to the expression. And that imagination of the form recovers because it can find the form out. Therefore, it can recover. If it could not have found the form out, if the imagination would have remained floating without the form, the imagination would not have recovered the original aesthetic object and the aesthetic subject and their encounter. Because it is a form, and therefore it can accommodate what fits into that form. And what fits into the form comes from uh, the original experience, which is lying at a certain layer behind this imagination. Uh, and therefore, you can see the play of aesthetic subjectivity here. The aesthetic subjectivity uh, moves away from the aesthetic object, but it returns back to the aesthetic object once again by way of imagination of the form of the aesthetic object. You know. uh, so, so Delius thinks that that's an important, important achievement of the Kantian notion of imagination and aesthetic. Uh, but, but, Delius points out, this imagination, I quote, does not relate to a determinate concept of understanding. It does not relate to a determinate concept of understanding. Very, very important. But it relates to the understanding itself. So understanding of the, the form leads to an understanding without... Uh, a determinate understanding. It's not like understanding an X with a certain property, uh, but it's a kind of understanding that the subject carries with herself. And that's very, very important. Uh, but then the understanding of the form and the recovery of the aesthetic object to this form uh, is not good enough. It's again, a certain kind of a starting point in imagination. But then imagination has to reflect now on what it has recovered. Imagination cannot just sit idle in the form of a static imagination after the recovery. As soon as the recovery happens, the imagination will start reflecting on what is recovered. And then it is no longer the formal reflection of the object. It's no longer the formal reflection of the object, of the object of art or the aesthetic object. It's no longer a formal reflection. Rather, you know, it's a concept of reflection or a concept of reflexivity that arises from imagination. And that reflexivity would now connect it to the process of dynamical synthesis that is happening all around. You know. And that is how once an artist is interviewed, you know, once Fida Hussein is interviewed about his relationship with Picasso, or uh, Ramkin Corbeige is interviewed about his relationship with Tagore, for example, 
uh, uh, these relationships are a sort of uh, a certain kind of reflection through which uh, uh, the the object you know is not present uh, and Deleuze would call it it's a reflection without a concept and specifically without the concept of an object because it's just a form and an understanding and a form and an understanding is not a formal reflection on an object so the object the aesthetic object goes missing from here at this stage as one reflects on the aesthetic object itself and this is something very significant by reflecting on the aesthetic object the aesthetic object goes missing the reflection progresses the understanding progresses uh, but there is no fixed concept of the aesthetic object in this process of reflection and this is something which is again a source of or a beginning of uh, a great aesthetic experience and this kind of a, uh, a beginning of a great aesthetic experience is uh, characterized you know uh, in a variety of artistic forms for example in french impressionist or dadaist art this kind of a uh, this kind of a suspension of the aesthetic object in the course of reflection and in the course of establishing a relation between uh, a variety of reflexive minds, a variety of reflexive, reflexive aesthetic minds coming from a number of aesthetic subjects, you know, who are trying to understand each other's expression, you know, as if it forms a community of aesthetic experiences. And this community of aesthetic experiences um, is now bound by a certain power of sensation as Dadaists or Impressionist or Cubist art of the contemporary French uh, tradition would be talking about. Uh, and they would be talking about uh, a, a certain kind of object, you know. They, they find this process of reflection itself, you know, as a certain kind of an irreducible object by itself. Although it doesn't have objectivity, yet it's an object. Uh, uh, because it is doubly suspended, you know, it's doubly suspended from uh, the original source aesthetic object. And also it is suspended from uh, a very definitive form of that aesthetic object. It's doubly suspended. And this double suspension of the aesthetic object uh, gives rise to a floating entity, apparently lost, cut out by Skittiers of, skittiers of its aspect. Although this floating entity and the aesthetic object is lost in reflection, its aspects, some of its aspects are present. And this, this aspectual reflective form without a definite content, but at the same time carried through multiple expressions between multiple aesthetic subjects, you know, uh, gives rise to something like a phantom, something like a silhouette, something like a shadow. You know. and, and that artistic content of a shadow, of a floating entity, you know, uh, is something which is inspired by Renaissance conception of art, historically. Uh, and uh, this Renaissance conception of art uh, is, uh, is uh, let's look at, uh, uh, for example, a famous work you know, by, uh, by Mary Laurent, you know, by Mary Laurent in 1881, an Italian painter uh, called Ocham, let's say. There's a famous painting which is there in Louvre you know, and the postmodern uh, gallery of art. Both in both places is there. So autumn, you know, autumn, uh, which is a blue screen plane upon which is painted a veil, a blue screen plane upon which is painted a veil, a veil speckled with flowers, phantomatically doubling artist's own silhouette, 
very similar. A profile portrait of her, whom French poet Malam compared to a flagrant rose, one that is also very much inspired by any kind of Renaissance art. These are so many flowers braided in the very retina of the eye, which receives upon its blank page the volatile phosphates, pollens of flesh that one might compare to the seeds that in winter polarize the orientation of crystals on a frozen vein, unfolding petals whose destiny is not to reproduce, but to be assigned to the daphne of a virtual landscape that evokes the decisive colorations of the brain. One could not describe the effect and its logic better than George Dutwit, who writes, the model, irrefutable, striking, is no longer a model. This is something that provoked the laughter of contemporaries, memory, which in those times could still find itself contradictory, bore inscribed into its register, nothing like this mouth springing from a paradoxical gamut of scarlet and black touches upon which is inscribed furtively, vehemently, the interstices of two lips. So this silhouette is imagined in a, in a, in a variety of way. And therefore, uh, the aesthetic reflection now is able to create uh, a form, a form which is expressed in the form of a silhouette. You know. And the effect that it produces is something like a relation between a number of painters or a number of connoisseurs. And the relation also creates uh, a very different imag imagery of uh, love or a landscape or something else uh, that every Renaissance painting would otherwise create. So therefore, Malam would write, the effect produced without dissonance, without a flourish, even an adorable one, which distracts. And this is what I say, Malam would say. One paints an effect with an A, as one paints a woman, a negress, a bouquet from a client, a cat as opposed to the dog, or an other, which the painter wants to keep. This would make a tremendous background for certain things that I am thinking of at a certain moment, Malam would say. So you can see this aesthetic reflection goes into a certain kind of configuration whose relations are external, whose relations are uh, some kind of a projection and some kind of an imprinting themselves onto the canvas in which there is something real already that exists. And this is an experience that is created by entirely by this process of reflection. And uh, this is where uh, you can see that the aesthetic subject is no longer the original aesthetic subject. And this is beautifully expressed by uh, Tagore, you know, in his idea of coloration. Now Tagore in his idea of color, has talked about how colors are perceived. So Tagore says that the uh, four-dimensional color space, four-dimensional color space, color space is not three-dimensional. Color space is four-dimensional. And one dimension of the color space remains invisible. His famous poem of 1937, the poem is called Me or Ami, 1937. Uh, which is translated beautifully by uh, Monica Verma. She translated it beautifully. Let me read the first few lines of that poem, which deals with Malam's notion of silhouette and the creation of an extended landscape out of that silhouette. So Tagore says, it was from my sentiments, it was from my sentiments that the emerald derived its green and the ruby its red. I turned my eyes up in the sky and there was light in the east and to the west. I looked at the rose and said, you are beautiful. 
and the rose gained its beauty. This is what Professor Borua says about the beholder. But a little more than being the beholder. You may say that this is metaphysics and not poetry, Tego says. My answer is that it is the truth and therefore poesy. It is the truth, therefore poesy. You may call it my vanity, but it is so on behalf of all men. It is on the canvas of men's vanity that the creator displays his art of creation. Okay, it goes on, long poem. Let me read another very, uh, very interesting a few lines. Bereft of poetry, the maker engaged in calculations of existence, devoid of personality, will sit desolate and alone in a sky devoid of color. Nowhere in this universe, not in its furthest reaches, not in spaces beyond eternity's way, in worlds upon worlds, will these words resound. You are beautiful and I love. Will the maker then once again sit in meditation, age upon age, and chant in prayer, speak, speak, speak again, say, you are beautiful, repeat, I love. So what Tagore is trying to say is that the four dimensions of color, which is, uh, of color compared to that as humans we are not able to see more than three dimensions of color okay and therefore in our aesthetic imagination we can recover by a retroaction an expression about various dimensions of color and these expressions will fill up the cognitive inability of the human species in getting to the aspects or the aspectual features of the art object, which is recovered in our imagination and which establishes a dynamic synthesis with other creatures, you know, maybe with some marine creatures who have this four dimensional perception of color or five dimensional perception of color as Tigori is talking about in his poem, Me. So therefore, uh, just to close this uh, particular discussion, I would say that uh, self as something that is felt as unitary can be conceived as an aesthetic effect. It can be conceived only as an aesthetic effect with an A. And the self refers to the emotionally unified experience through the creation of an aesthetic object. Uh, it is a constant effect of the artistic dimension of a discourse, though outer, through outer and inner speech, it endures as a feeling of unity because of the repetitive and normative character of our social life, which must be constantly, constantly performed. Effect here is used following, uh, following uh, so many thinkers like William James or Tagore as an emergent tendency. It does not mean that self is causally produced as something, as an entity, but that the feeling of unity is an emergent tendency that is aesthetic in nature. We experience ourselves as aesthetic objects, as consummated unities. We experience our dialogicality, uh, responding to it as an aesthetic whole. The artistic manipulation of form matter, to which the dialogicality of life is immersed, we presuppose is technically and arbitrarily presented in accentuated tension as an object outside us, as a strange thing that we can contemplate and appropriate. By doing so, we are emotionally engaged in new ways, but as a unified and emotionally resolved active contemplator, our artistic expressions creates its public in the sense that it emotionally unifies it, resolving and not dissolving the diversity of its multi-layered and dynamic experience. I think uh, here I'll stop. I'm so sorry that I didn't go by my PowerPoint, but this is how philosophers do talk. Yeah, so oh, you have to be used to it. Thank yeah. you so much, sir.
for a very interesting deliberation. Um, we also have uh, papers on aesthetics in uh, two of our semesters. And uh, I'm sure not just those students who have opted for the paper, even others, they must have learned a lot. We have quite a few questions in our chat box also. Sure. We will uh, take, take them up. Sure, I can take all the questions. I have a lot of time, no problem. No shortage yes. of time. Yes, oh, yeah. take the questions from the chat box. So, sure. um, and um, I wow. have myself uh, uh, really learned a lot, even though I teach aesthetics, but then learning new uh, perspectives about uh, aesthetics is so interesting. And uh, so we experience ourselves as um, aesthetic objects, um, as you said, and, uh, and as, you know, uh, maybe putting it this way as effectuated harmonies uh, entities uh, and we understand our uh, dialogic uh, self as uh, something uh, uh, which is in response uh, uh, to the aesthetic whole uh, because we uh, parts make the whole as we understand and uh, so the aesthetic, uh, so the artistic micro uh, managing of uh, uh, forms in uh, it, it is presented in highlighted, uh, you know, tension as you use the word tension or traction as an other, something which is outside us. And then it gets appropriated in time. And this, this process then results in uh, a multidimensional and very uh, uh, many kinds of forceful experiences. Right. So uh, in GIS, this is what I gathered from your uh, uh, presentation. There are many more things which I have been noting down in between, which I later on share with my students also. And uh, it is absolutely fine, sir. There was perhaps some misunderstanding. I Maybe we thought that the presentation would be shown in between, but this is absolutely fine. You have been generous enough to share the PPT with us. We will, as you uh, uh, told in between, we will share it with our students. Uh, and we also are very uh, glad and happy to be joined. Uh, I mean, he has been throughout. He has been from the beginning, Professor Pradeep Jyoti Mohanto, sir. Uh, he's uh, he's the senior professor of our department. He's also the dean in charge of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. And uh, he also has a lot of hold in this particular field of study. Um, and uh, sir, can we have some observations from you? also regarding the webinar and the theme. So it is there, but I think uh, he is, uh, we will get back to sir. He's having yeah. some connectivity issue, I think. He's there in the meeting, we'll get back to him. In the meantime, can we address a few of the questions, sir? Yeah, I can. I have seen those questions. You know, can I pick up a question which is from uh, Shumanta Datta? You know, uh, the first question that I want to okay. pick up is about uh, Duchamp's fountain. You know, Marshall Duchamp's fountain. So, if you look at the fountain, you know, uh, the fountain uh, is not only conceptual. You know, as uh, as it is characterized uh, traditionally as a kind of conceptual art, but it is not merely conceptual, but it is a certain configuration, which is uh, perhaps anti-rational, which is uh, perhaps anti-reflexive as well. So a piece of art that challenges the very process of aesthetic perception, uh, a piece of art that uh, challenges the claim of regulative character of our aesthetic reflection, uh, but at the same time, opens us, opens up, opens us up to you know, a new form, you know, uh, which is uh, a certain kind of a, uh, you can say, a, a new kind of exhibition. You know, it opens up, opens us up to a new formation altogether. You know, which, uh, if I take uh, Deleuze's understanding of Marcel Duchamp, you know, Deleuze would say that it deterritorializes the art form. It deterritorializes it in order to uh, create a certain kind of, you know, certain kind of a flux, a certain kind of a move away from, you know, the, the identity of the art object 
and disfigures it in a certain way, defamiliarizes it, so that you know a better uh, conception or a better interpretation can be created without having a fixed understanding of what a fountain is all about. So a fountain is a fountain in an ironical sense. A fountain is also a fountain in the sense of losing itself in a certain you know, kind of a structure. Uh, and therefore, a fountain can be reconceived uh, in a manner that uh, such a structure that takes it off can also be at the background of the fountain. And therefore, fountain is just not the fountain alone. The fountain is connected to its own contraries. The fountain can create an irony of itself. And the fountain can also evoke a sense of uh, not having a fountain, a sense of non being which cannot be correlated to the fountain. So, so it challenges uh, the entire gamut of perception uh, that is attached to the notion of the fountain. So, so this is how, you know, uh, you can think of a value, but value again, not in the sense of uh, the values like good and right, but a fountain, the, the fountain that Duchamp has created can give you a sense of value, which is an extraordinary sense of value a novel sense of interpretation. And therefore, uh, it creates a very different impression. And that's the, that's the work that Cubists have done. And Duchamp was very much, uh, very much interested in Cubism. And therefore, this Cubist uh, form of absurdity uh, arises in Duchamp's uh, uh, installation called Fountain. Yeah. And that's how I look at it. So that's one question uh, that I have addressed. Uh, the other two questions are, uh, do I address it myself or you want to say? Uh, Whichever way you are comfortable. If you want no, no, you can say now. I, I just wanted to take that question myself. Rather, other questions we can talk about. Okay, okay. So uh, let me start then from uh, this question, which is from a student, Kaima. She's from MA4. She asks, since we know aesthetics is mostly about pleasing experiences and causes is positivity, so does the aesthetics of self in terms of philosophy avoids the criticism of life? Mm -hmm. No, no. I mean, that will create a different sense of criticism, aesthetics of self. Because aesthetics of self is driven towards a certain kind of recovery. And in the process of recovery, what one would observe are the shortcomings or the deficits. And also one would observe a certain kind of a surplus, a certain kind of an extra quality, which is otherwise not there in that piece of art. So that piece of art will now be open to a bigger interpretation, which we can call as critique. A certain kind of a critique of life will engen engender, sorry, engender out of uh, this observation, which is a reflection back on an aesthetic object. And from there, a new conception of life can also emanate. Uh, but the point here is that uh, the aesthetic object shall always remain a transcendental to our act of critique. And by remaining as a transcendental to our act of critique, it would mobilize certain critical parameters that are part of our process of reflection or process of reasoning. So therefore, it would certainly be directed towards uh, the, in the best possible way, uh, to an area of life where it fits into, or to an area of life that can interrogate the very conception of that art object. So you can see the movement forward from reflection to the movement forward, uh, which is a movement forward towards how other people, how other possible aesthetic interpretations can be created out of a particular piece of art. So, so it will give rise to a kind of a social critique, which is a larger field of communication. So therefore, uh, absorption in the first personal level is only to create the critical interpreters who are later open to a mutual engagement uh, for a critique of life itself. You can say it like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Kaima, I suppose that answers your query. Uh, we have another, it's a longish question uh, from another student from MA4. 
Right. He asked, can you explain phenomenology concerning time? So, uh, for instance, we perceive the external world and sense the changes going around with regard to time, but we cannot sense the change within us and our development of consciousness. And our physical changes can be critically analyzed, but not our inner self. Does that mean nothing is changing around? Everything is in its constant state and only our interpretation of the physical world is changing. This is from uh, this Marshall. Is, yeah, and this is the problem of determinism. Apparently, uh, the outer physical world is all determined. You know, and the way it is determined, whether that kind of determinate physical world can exactly be received in our senses. Our senses are not passive. They are open to the determinate physical order. They are also open to the kind of changes that are happening in the physical world. Now, both determinism and alterations and changes you know, uh, are present together in a receptive mind. In a sense, a receptive mind is divided. There is an experience of duality between change and uh, stasis. Uh, but this experience of duality would result into a certain kind of a search, a certain kind of a quest on the nature of things. Whether there is some underlying metaphysical principle which determines the stasis as well as the change. Or if there is no such grounding principle whether the phenomenal, the, the phenomenal world as such, the way it is experienced uh, in the external world, whether that experience can remain just an external experience or that external experience can also be interiorized. Certainly it can be interiorized by a receptive mind. So therefore, our mind is part of that physical world. Physical world is not completely outside our mind because mind is part of that physical world. And being part of the physical world, it is able to receive certain things in a certain way by twisting it in its own way. And therefore, you know, both the change and the stasis can be simultaneously organized and simultaneously inquired, simultaneously inquired into, simultaneously being engaged with. And that will give rise to a certain form of representation, which may be contradictory, but at the same time, mind really develops a lot of resources out of such contradictions. And it produces certain images which are more, uh, which are more fruitful, which are more uh, germane in the sense of the value, in the sense of artistic imagination that emanate from them. So therefore, these contradictions are most welcome. They are not really regulated by uh, the external physical order in a law-like manner. Mind assumes a certain kind of free will which uh, physical world cannot give it. And because of this free will, mind can impinge on the physical world and can create a different sense of the physical world than what actually it is. And that's the caliber of the mind or the capacity of the mind, which is absolutely necessary for an aesthetic imagination of the physical world, okay? Right, so this is what I would like to say. Yes, yeah. thank you so much, sir. That's. Uh really helpful. I'm sure Masood also uh, has been benefited with your answer. We have another question from Jugal Bhattacharya, sir. He's a colleague from the Department of Economics. He asks, how one can avoid blind application of concepts that we are already familiar with, maybe prejudices? He talks about, uh, can we assume that critical judgment, he asks rather, can we assume that critical judgments are unique in the eyes of all? Yeah, I mean, critical judgments also have a subjective content. We can't uh, forget that. Uh, critical judgments assume a certain vantage point. It assume a certain perspective on the world. It's not a judgment from nowhere, but it's a judgment from somewhere. The moment we understand the perspective, the framework, in terms of which the judgment is shaped, and the judgment is having an object of critique, you know, the question would be whether the judgment and the object of critic have an identity between them or whether they are having a non-identical relationship. 
Uh, if I follow uh, critical theories like Frankfurt School, they would say that the judgment and the object of critic are never identical. They have this relationship of non-identity. And because they have this relationship of non-identity, it, it, is, it is able to create a sense of, uh, a different sense of solidarity out of uh, this non-identity. It can give rise to a critical perspective to which a number of subjects subscribe to. It can also give an oppositional perspective. It can give a perspective to resist certain ideas as well. So therefore, the taking of the vantage point is important and it's not important to establish a kind of a linear identity between the judgment and the object of prayer. It is rather open to all kinds of possibilities. It's also possible that some people are having a prejudiced mind and to prevent the application of this prejudiced mind, more critical ideas needs to be uh, pumped into uh, this situation of prejudice. And these more critical ideas would come from elsewhere, which will create new turning points in our uh, practice of critique. It will give rise to new practices as well. And therefore, uh, the new possibilities of critique directed towards uh, certain old objects of judgment. Uh, can help us removing the prejudices. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for answering, and thank you, Jugal, sir, for that question. I want uh, to ask a question. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 yes ma'am. Well, indeed, that was a beautiful lecture, and a different take on aesthetics, absolutely. When you said that appreciative process itself is a historic process, right? So. Uh, a different domain of knowledge itself, which I have been telling students all the time that, that aesthetic awareness or appreciation, it is a structured consciousness. It is a more of you know, perception and judgment and taste. One thing that I want to ask uh, well, is that you know, um, uh, Husserl had said rejection of all preconceived, all right? That everything. So it should be like uh, absolutely yeah, unconditional, a clean state. Yeah. Yeah. So just now you had talked about judgment and uh, everyone has his own subjective analysis and it leads to the maybe the appreciative process or whatever. But then at the same time, don't you think that the, um, uh, we don't go by, you know, it adds to the cultivation, like in music, right? When you have the aesthetic appreciation of music, right? If you know the grammar, the vocabulary, what others have done, only then the appreciative process becomes more, all right? Cognitive effect is enlarged and new dimension has come out. Same thing as with uh, painting, like the impressionist, or as you said, the cubist, like uh, Picasso, Guernica. And uh, what was his genre, you know? How did they, you know, wanted to uh, represent? Sure. their emotions or experience. So don't you think that um, that part, that background you know, understanding of whatever uh, forms of representation is given adds to the appreciative process? Yes, I mean, they enter into the appreciative process, no doubt. The dialogical. Yes, but how yeah. they are synthesized with the, respect to with respect to the current experience, right. with respect to the kind of reflection that is happening at the mm -hmm. moment of encountering an object, mm -hmm. and then connecting it to other similar kind of aesthetic subjects, this entire process, the holistic uh, kind of the field, which starts with some background belief, no doubt, but it extends itself, you know, which itself is a kind of performance. And therefore, the text would be changing in relation to my present kind of performance and then my connection to a similar performer who is uh, trying to perform in a very different way. So therefore, uh, this uh, will create a sense of co-belonging, a kind of co-being or a kind of a co-processing by participating. And this participation is uh, simultaneous or it may be sometimes at different points of time, how 
a certain aesthetic idea is translated to the other person, one who is located in a different time and space. And then that opens up the possibility of a dialogue provided there is an access to each other. If that access is not there, how we create that access to that process of aesthetic dialogue is something very, very important. And that's where aesthetic education, uh, the readiness to appreciate aesthetic experiences, and also to take part in different kinds of performances uh, by breaking uh, the silos of performers and the spectators uh, are necessary. So, so there are these ways in which participation is always enhanced. And if there is enhanced participation, it is possible to become more and more holistic and to have a more multi-layered, multi-dimensional perspective than the present perspective that one is holding on to. And that's a kind of a opening up of a phenomenological field, a new field of senses, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, Husserl would say that uh, it is uh, a certain kind of immanence and transcendence together. It's not transcendental, which yeah. is in relation to the subject. But yeah. if it is both immanence and transcendence, mm -hmm. Malupun is touching touch relationship for Husserl constituting and constituted simultaneously. Constituting as well as by constituting, it is getting constituted. And by getting constituted, it is further reconstituting itself. So this ongoing process of experiencing is a <laughs> phenomenological process. And that enhances our aesthetic taste in a very different way, in a newer dimension, I must say. Yeah. So you become an aesthetic object itself, a synthesis of yes. all this. Yes. Yes. And I think you know, our students have been very, very benefited by this, all right, because this is a very new dimension and where the communicative process, as you said, all right, which brings an, an immanence as well as a transcendence. And, uh, you become a different, you know, through a structured consciousness, you become a different being altogether, you know, where the object even is sometimes lost. As you said, the original object is also lost. Yes, but your consciousness has become a different level of dynamics. Yeah, very, very true and presented beautiful. Yes, thank you. I thank think you. they had a taste of a philosopher speaking to them. All right. Yeah. Really, we had also had a chance to talk to literature and aesthetic people, as people of aesthetic. We talk in philosophy departments, as you know, all kinds of things. But outside, we really talk. Yeah. This is a new dimension to all our students, especially, and I think they have been greatly benefited. Thank you very much. Okay, by the way, thank you so much as well yeah. for this appreciation. Thank you so much, ma'am, for. Uh, uh, your question and your views along with it. And I truly agree with you, our scholars and students uh, not will maybe they, are, they have already been benefited a lot and they can now divulge further into this area and come up with uh, their own perspectives and adding meanings to gaps that might be there in, uh, in, in literature. So uh, uh, maybe we can take two more questions. Which sure, still... please, please. I have no problem. Please, go ahead. Okay. Yes. Okay, Tell me. So we have a question from um, Karing Ronghampi. Hmm. And the question is, um, which are the points which should be focused on while analyzing a text or an object in a social setting through phenomenological lenses? Yeah. That's, a, that's a wonderful question and a very, very relevant question. Uh, precisely which are the points. One, of course, is uh, the historical experience. That is something always uh, the major part of constitution of a text. How the text is historically constituted, uncovering the history of the text. And history of the text connects itself to social history. You know, As Stephen Grinblatt, one of my favorite uh, uh, critiques uh, of Romanticism and Shakespearean critics, you know, who talks about uh, the enlightened pigeon holes. You know, a text creates some enlightened pigeon holes through which the events of the time, the important characters of the time can be located. So therefore, a text can be read in direct relation to certain actors who are actors in history. 
and how they have played a certain role and how that role is represented in a text. So the text assumes a certain kind of historical materiality, as Stephen Grinblatt would say. And he would say that the reading of the text is something like crossing the boundary. It's crossing the boundary between the literary, the aesthetic, and the historical. The literary, aesthetic, and the social. The literary, aesthetic, and the performatively cultural. You know, a text can be performed uh, by way of an interpretation, by way of a dialogue, even by way of uh, an argumentation and counter argumentation. So therefore a text has many layers and many substructures already in grain. One has to open up these layers, these substructures in order to carry out a certain argumentation, in order to produce a certain sense of reflection on the text or an sense of reading of the text. And this is how a text would be transformed into uh, a multiple source of meaning, where the meaning making process is no longer something unique or unitary, but meaning making process is something relative to the acts of meaning, the acts of meaning that can arise from uh, understanding the substructures, the roles, the layers, the subjects, the agents, the actors, the situations, like we do in a dramatic text, for example. Uh, this is one way of going about. The other important thing that Derrida talks about, that a text is like an institution, and an institution is protected by certain things. An institution is protected from interventions from outside. Now, reading a text would be opening it to these interventions that are coming from outside. A text is not closed onto itself, into its own frame of dialogue. But rather this frame is to be opened up to a radical outside uh, to make possible certain interventions, certain kinds of readings, readings that would unsettle the neat structure of the hierarchies that are present in a text. So therefore, the hierarchies, the elements, the, the various kinds of constitutive aspects of this text now can be displaced, can be displaced, can be substituted by the larger social interventions, uh, which uh, can happen in theoretical terms. It can happen in terms of concrete political practices, social practices, cultural practices. So it, a text can be opened up to multiple other forms of theorization and multiple other forms of, forms of praxis. So why you can now think of you know, reading a text by looking at its uh, structure, and by removing those elements that connect it uh, as if it is a uh, unitary structure. And that, that's a kind of a deconstruction. And then further, you can look at the text by looking at on the aspects on which the text is not saying anything. And text is remaining silent. The silent aspects of the text, the marginal, the peripheral aspects of the text. If you can decode that, that will produce a new interpretation of the text which will also change the character of the text. And it will present the text in a very new way and create a different set of people as its audience. And it can enter into a new dialogue between the audience, the new set of audience and the, and the newly understood text to give rise to a very different meaning of the text altogether. So, so this is how we can open up the text. It's a process of opening up instead of closing the text to itself, okay? It's opening it, opening the text to the other, as Derrida would call it, to the alternative, to the alternative possibilities, as Tagore would call it. So text has to be read in a Tagorean way by opening it up to alternative possibilities, and text has to be read in a Derridian way by opening its silences in a certain way. And these are the creative ways of reading the text. Okay, that's it. Right. Pranami, you can look at Anna, any other question. What happened? Your voice is not coming. Pranami, open your voice. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. So, yes, uh, Deridian reading of a text and all that. And uh, then we come up with uh, what uh, also ha what Hans Robert Joss says, um, you know, there's something suddenly came to my mind about horizon of expectations, which broadens, proliferates, meaning of the text proliferates. And I think 
phenomenological aesthetics can be a very wonderful um, and an, um, um, I won't say new altogether because it has been there, but then perhaps the uh, uh, its um, reach has not been harnessed enough. So that can be a very beautiful way of uh, making out new meanings from the uh, silent, marginal, marginal and peripheral aspects of the texts that you have mentioned just now. Thank you for that uh, beautiful answer, sir. And the next question, which is there, is from Gemini Fukon. Yes. She asks, okay, she has um, numbered her questions. So, okay, while filling or traveling the gap from the self to the art object, where does the creator of the uh, creator or author of the artwork reside? Okay, that is her first question. And then uh, she asks, does the self of the author constitute the plural understanding? I think our questions are related. Yeah, so, yeah very, uh, much. very much related. Correct. I yes. can see that question. But yes. I mean, I can take the questions if it is written down. I can see this. Now I'll answer the question. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, all the questions are absolutely necessary and relevant questions that arise from my talk itself. I could see that. So. Um, in relation to the uh, location of the creator author of the artwork, you know, uh, the creator does not reside you know, just in the artwork. As we say that the author is dead. In what sense the author is dead? In the sense that once this artwork is created, you know, the author is no longer present in the artwork. The author is rather erased in the artwork. And once the author is erased in the artwork, the authorial imagination and the authorial intent and the implied connoisseurs or implied readers of what the author or the creator has created, you know, they take it over. They take it over from the author. And once they take it over from the author, what is happening is that they will be decoding the authorial intent they would be changing their roles from just being an implied reader to uh, a more performative reader. They would reconstitute the text in relation to the way they want to perform. And in all that, the meaning making process will become slightly complicated because the new meanings that will be created by the uh, readers, by the, you know, by the participants in the text, uh, that will establish a new kind of relationship with the earlier text or the proto text with which one has started. The proto text will become an altered text. You know, if I use a very interesting notion that Umberto Eco uses, you know, in his uh, in his uh, collection of essays, very interesting collection of essays called. Interpretation and Overinterpretation, Umbato Eco's Essays, uh, which is published from Cambridge University Press, 1993. So Eco says that uh, by the intervention of the performers, of the readers, you know, the proto text is now transformed into an altered text. And the altered text can sometimes be highly discontinuous. It may not maintain a continuity, umbilical, it may not maintain that umbilical continuity with the proto text. And there can be breaks, there can be disruptions, there can be ruptures, there can be reconstructions and deconstructions uh, as an ongoing process, you know, without yeah. uh, terminating the process with a certain objective, uh, which is predecided. So, so it will open up the text to an indeterminate process of understanding, you know, and that's how the author or the creator won't reside in the text. Although we know that as an assumption, we know that who is the author, that's just an assumption. And that assumption is now converted into uh, a kind of a recreation of the entire notion of who is an author, you know. So that's the first question. Yes, self of the author can also become part of the plural understanding that the readers will make because self of the author is no longer the original Pristein self of the author. Rather, it's the self that is created through the interpretations by the reader. 
and therefore the self of the author also will undergo a certain kind of a change or alteration along with the altered text that the readers will produce out of the uh, proto text. Uh, now comes the creator's imagination created constitute the dynamic syn synthesis. As I said, imagination is not constitutive, but it is only regulated. Mark that. If imagination becomes constitutive, then imagination would control uh, what it produces. But imagination can only help synthesizing. It does not control what it produces. And therefore, the rule of imagination is only regulative, as Khan points out. It's not constitutive. So the imagination of the author, the imagination of the connoisseurs, all these are sort of, they are just to regulate the creation of a new form. A form which is without a content, but a form which can accommodate a lot of content into it without, uh, without uh, making it the flesh of that particular form. Uh, by keeping the form open and at the same time engaging into an aesthetic communication, it is possible to synthesize in a dynamical sense. A static sense of synthesis would be to end up with filling up the form, but a dynamic sense of uh, uh, synthesis would be to move on to the other forms that are created by other people in the process of participating in the whole process of aesthetic appreciation. Okay, so, so it's a kind of a chain of creations. It's a kind of a sequence of uh, aesthetic participation and uh, multiple imaginations coming into a certain kind of a play, an indeterminate play. And that makes artistic process much more interesting than a kind of a workshop where everyone follows each other's work and creates a work by following someone else's work as a response. Uh, a workshop which is open to something which is not yet, something which is not there. That is the multiple uh, possibility, possibility of the multiple rather, and uh, possibility of a process which is not limited by mere imagination. It will be more dynamic than that, okay? So that's what, um, uh, and recovery and dynamic synthesis is not circular because recovery would lead to a new constitution of an object. Yeah. Recovery, that new constitution leads to another recovery. Another recovery will lead to another constitution, but recovery as a process is not constitutive of what is constituted? Recovery is just regulated. It regulates constitution. So that is what is dynam dynamism is all about. This both handed amphibian regulation, constitution, regulation, constitution in a sequentiality is what dynamic synthesis is all about. All right. I think that's what answers her question. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Gemini, uh, sir. And yeah. you must uh, have, uh, you know, your question must have been answered by sir properly uh, to the best of your requirement, I'm sure. Uh, last two questions, sir, uh, yeah. uh, from two of our students, Daifi, and um, I, I think I would merge the two questions. Uh, yeah. Daifi asks, is uh, uh, self as an aesthetic effect may actually vary in its intensity depending on life circumstances? And uh, Shreyosi yeah. asks if aesthetics yeah. Yeah. can be related to romanticism. Yeah, I mean, as you know, the Bildungsroman, you know, self-formation, negative capability, blah, blah, you all learn all that. But that is there with you, Bildungsroman and negative capability, cold rage and things like that. Uh, but the point is that the intensity of the constitution, you know, the intensity is not determined and governed by the circumstances alone. But the intensity is a certain kind of, you know, heightening of a subjective process, uh, which is something like free will of the subject. You know, the subject moves beyond the apparent or the real, you know, by moving beyond what appears and what is real. The subject is able to rise up to a different realm, you know, which I called as the realm of synthesis. You know. A different kind of a synthesis can happen where the old subjective self is no longer present you know, and the old objective world is no longer present. Uh, rather, there is an absence of both the subjective and the objective. 
in this process of heightening and intensifying the, the subjective process of uh, imagining, recovery, or synthesizing you know, all these processes, they are sort of are able to disconnect themselves you know, from something that is grounded, something that is just connected to circumstances. So it can transcend the circumstances in a sense. The subjective process is such that it can transcend the circumstances. And because it transcends the circumstances, then the question comes, it affects the subject. It affects the process of constitution, you know, uh, in a certain way. And the effect produced is that of dissonance. There's a dissonance between the subject and the subjective constitution of the art or the aesthetic. There's a dissonance between the two. It's not in consonance. There's a certain kind of diachrony instead of a synchrony. So, so this diachronic dissonant process of constitution of the subject of aesthetic instead of just the subjective process by which a subject is guided, you know, is a larger process. And this opens up imagination without being bounded by the realm of the senses. It can rather create new ideas of sensual and supersensory and extrasensory. It can go beyond the language and move to the realm of the translinguistic, you know. And therefore, it can come out with something which is totally new, which is hitherto not there in the world. And that's how art attracts uh, the, every time a new piece of art comes, it generates a lot of serendipity a new sense of curiosity, a, a new sense of inquisitiveness, a se new sense of knowing, an entirely new set of relations to the newly formed you know, realm of the aesthetic. Yeah. Every time there's this dissociation between the subjective process and the subjective constitution of the aesthetic object. Every time there's this dissociation, it opens up to something new entirely new and one has to encounter and welcome what is produced out of that newness and freshness. Okay. Thank you, sir. Your answers have been presentations in themselves and not just answers, just like your um, pain presentation and deliberation. Uh, I have, uh, people have been mentioning in the chat box and also have been receiving messages on WhatsApp. This has really been a very, very wonderful deliberation of webinar, sir. Um, in the big, uh, somewhere in between, I had mentioned uh, PJ uh, Pradeep Jyoti Mohanto, sir, uh, being in the meeting. He's uh, still there in the meeting, but then uh, unfortunately, he'll not be able to speak because he's having uh, a lot of connectivity issue today. So, but then, um, uh, so, so uh, we are all very thankful to him for actually fa facilitating this webinar, uh, getting in touch with you and then uh, uh, helping us with all other uh, things. So uh, with this, we come to an end of the webinar and uh, very, very interesting session indeed. And uh, so I would like to put it this way that, um, you know, it is often believed that uh, things like success, uh, money uh, and uh, a prestigious career can make us happy. Uh, however, uh, using statistical analysis, uh, you know, on data gathered by various surveys, there are various surveys, I mean, uh, we can find on, on the internet, and as well as data they collected, it has been discovered that, uh, you know, which all of us know that uh, people's happiness can be contributed to uh, living in an aesthetically beautiful place, which is more important than the rest, maybe. So it is, and, and it is also concluded that our perception of beauty um, produces feelings we associate with happiness, like calmness, appreciation, reflection, and hope. So in a sense, uh, appreciating beauty alters our emotions and makes us feel happier. Uh, and as Krishna Madam said, uh, that through a structured consciousness, we become a different and, and, and proliferated being altogether diverse beings, we, do, we just don't remain as one. So, and so phenomenological aesthetics is very important and uh, its uh, potentiality is enormous. We have known, we have, uh, we, we have already known, we have come to know a lot more today. And so this should be graphed, T 
deeply its potentiality. And as Sir mentioned in between that, let us rise up to the level of synthesis. And I um, absolutely believe in that. So with this, we come to an end of the webinar. Sir, um, thank you so much for your time um, and uh, your deliberation, the thoughts, the suggestions, the answers, everything have been very, very, very useful to us. The webinar is being recorded also, I'm sure. A lot many of us will come back to this recording for uh, uh, learning a lot more. And uh, uh, yes, looking forward to um, uh, meeting you in person, sir, like uh, uh, our no, vice no, we'll also mentioned, looking forward to meeting you in person in our campus very soon. We, we will have a lot more such webinars and seminars and hope uh, in, in campus we will have seminars and not webinars, but and a uh, lot other lot more other discussions with you. Thank you so much, sir, for being uh, with us. Pranami, before you go, can I get also a copy of the recording of this uh, entire session? Can I sure, share? Sure, sure. I'll make it available to you. Right. Definitely. Thank you. And I thank um, uh, Krishna, ma'am, um, for <laughs> being her lovely self as always, and uh, also informative, adding to the discussion. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, you are a part of the department, but I shouldn't be thanking you or maybe uh, Pradeep Jyoti Mohanto, sir. But then thank you for being there and uh, as a constant guide and uh, mentors to us. I uh, I thank you. Oh, uh, pulled it up very well, Pranami. So congrats <laughs> to you too for thank being you. a beautiful you know, anchor. Yes, yeah, you, you added to the aesthetics of the, of the theme with your flowers and your background, right? <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> thank you, ma'am, it means a lot. And I thank Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, um, uh, for uh, joining and uh, even though he was traveling and there was connectivity issue, so nice of him to have joined and encouraged us. He always does so. Uh, he's not there now, right now in the meeting, but then thank you so much, sir. I thank uh, all of my colleagues, uh, for uh, being behind the scenes and helping me throughout before the webinar, be, uh, during the webinar uh, as well. Thank you all of you so much. I, um, I once again thank Pradeep Jyoti Mohanto sir for facilitating this webinar and getting us connected to uh, Dr. Viswas. Uh, I thank all the participants for being there and uh, throughout and also encouraging us with your questions because questions are very important for making a session lively and meaningful. Thank you for that. I thank our management, IT department. I thank Registrar, ma'am. I thank our chairperson academics, Alok Kumar Buraguhai, sir, and everyone, even though they could not be present, but they have helped us in every way they can, they, they, they could have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Biswas, once again. And we call it a day. Have a good day, everyone. Krishna Baidu, Namaskar, Apuna, especially. Exactly. It's such a refreshing yeah. memory of the whole and time that we had. You are the same. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Next time when you come in, go ahead. Bye. Bye, Pranami. Bye. Bye. See you all. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day ahead. Yeah. Thank you.